It's actually got two different technical things that I'm going to bring together. Both of them are at the leading edge of the research that's being done in uh, a bunch of places around the world. But before I do that, I want to do a little, a little experiment. So what I'm, going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to advance the next slide, and there's going to be something on that slide. And I want you to shout out what it is when you see it. And I'm going to reward you with uh, a prize, whoever, whoever shouts at the thing out first, OK? Ready? Jordan. Tiger, you got it. OK. Oh, that's even better, but you, you, win, the, you win the prize. You can collect later. OK, now, uh, why, why, why am I doing this? No, it's a picture of the second. OK. <laughs> it is. Yes, yes, recursive, right. OK, so uh, what I wanted to do is talk for a moment about how wonderfully awesome and uh, unbelievable it is that within a fraction of a second, this object could be recognized. So if you calculate how many photons strike your pupils every second, it's an enormous number. And the number of photons that are striking your pupils is only a very small amount of the total information in which your senses are bathed. It's really amazing when you stop and think about how much stuff is out there. There's a famous quote by Richard Feynman that was made even more famous by its integration in one of these symph Symphony of Science songs about how awesomely amazing and mind-blowing it is to consider what is out there hitting us at every second of the day. So um, if you do the, do the numbers, it's roughly 10 to the 17, which is a, a large number. And uh, of that information, of course, your, your sensory apparatus can't absorb it all, and it actually doesn't need to. It absorbs some part of it. And there are estimates that place the number of uh, the information transfer from your retinas to your brain as being something around 10 to the 7 bits per second, which is still a, a very large number. That's like an Ethernet connection. But what you did in that fraction of a second when you were shown this image is you converted all of that massively large amounts of information. If you think about how much information is stored in those 10 to the 17 photons, it's an enormous amount. All the frequency information, the timing information, the number information, it's vast. Somehow, in a fraction of a second, your brain condensed all of that sea of information into an, uh, uh, a word that in some ways you can think of as a single bit. Of course, it's not, but you can think of it. Think of uh, about the, the, tiger, the tiger light bulb in your head. It's a light bulb. It's got tiger written on it. It is either on or off. If there's a tiger in your field of vision, it's on, it's sort of like a bit. So uh, how is this possible? Uh, it's not entirely clear, of course, because uh, the biological systems are very complex. But what I'm going to do is segue from that to uh, um, a very fascinating advance that's happened recently in computer science which in some ways, when you first see it, is magic. So when I first started reading the papers in this field, uh, I, I couldn't believe that it was true. And um, I still, to a certain extent, can't wrap my head around it. But uh, it's very straightforward mathematically. So if you think about it from the mathematical or technical perspective of how to implement this, it's extremely straightforward. But it seems to have ramifications that I'm still having trouble with understanding. And this field is called compressive sensing or compressive sampling. So at a very high level, the idea is this. If I have a signal, let's say that picture of a tiger or um, a music file or a movie, anything that you can think of as, as containing information, some data, I can do the following. I can take the full object in all of its glory, all of those 10 to the 17 photons, or however you want to describe your movie or your image, and I can, I can randomly sample a very, very small part of it. And when I mean very small, I mean very small. Something that goes like the logarithm of the number of pixels, say, for example, in this image. So if you've got a megabit, uh, megabit image, take the log of that multiply it by some number, which is roughly 10,000 or so, 
And that's the number of samples you need to take of the original image. That is a hugely compressed object. So let's say I take a movie um, that's, say, a, a gigabyte. You can only take, say, for example, one out of every million pixels in that object, randomly sample throughout the entire thing. And now you have another object, which I'm calling undersampled. It doesn't have anywhere near the same amount of information as the original object. Now that highly compressed thing, I can then send around the world. I can, I can put it on a CD. I can send it over the internet. I can communicate it however I want. And the magic behind this compressive sensing idea is that I can take that undersampled object and then by solving a bunch of heavy duty computational problems, reconstruct the original object with near perfect fidelity. So if that doesn't blow your mind, it's, it's just amazing. You can only take, say, a million millionth of the amount of pixels that are required to represent, say, a movie, send them, and then at the other end, expend computational power to reconstruct the object and almost always get it exactly right. So that's the premise of compressive sensing. Now, you might th sort of think about how can that possibly be? Haven't I lost something in terms of information when I did that undersampling of the original object? And again, I've got to admit, I don't quite have my head wrapped around this, but the way, the way that you can think about this is that the world around us, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of borrow from some of Suzanne's concepts here. The world around us has a lot of structure in it. We don't tend to interact with things that are completely random. This technique that I've talked about doesn't work with random objects. If I were to take a completely random image, this will fail. It, it works somehow because the objects that we care about in video or, f or, or, or pictures or text or whatever, they have structure in them and it's somehow tied to the fact that we wrote them down at all. And in the tiger image, the reason why we're so good at detecting tigers is pretty obvious. Because there's this giant thing with teeth and it's running at you and if you can't say tiger within a fraction of a second, you're going to get eaten. And the genes that were faulty in you that didn't have that tiger detection thing are going to get weeded out over time. So there's something about the way that we interact with the world that makes it so that the things we care about, we write about, we, we, we talk about, these are all compressible in the sense that they don't have a lot of information content in them. And so what this somehow allows you to throw away all that other garbage. And this is very, uh, this allows you to have some insights about the way that any biological system can exist in the world. How is it that a bacteria swimming in an ocean of information can make a determination in a fraction of a second that something's about to eat it? it somehow may be related to this fact that there actually isn't a lot of critically important information in that sea of information. And the bacteria can evolve sensors that only sample a very tiny fraction of what's going on around it and still make that call. Okay, so the second thing I'm going to talk about is uh, quantum computing. Um, I'm involved with an effort that is attempting to, and to a certain extent has succeeded in building these types of machines. Um, if you've heard about this field, there's probably been a lot of misleading stuff that you've read. It's not, it's not, really, um, it's not really as wonderful as you may have been led to believe. Quantum computers are just physics-based processors. They, they, they use the laws of physics at the very small scale to try to solve problems in an analog fashion. So just like you try to build an analog chip to sense light, say for example like a CCD pixel or something like this. Quantum computers are like CCD pixels in a way. They try to exploit physics, although on the quantum mechanical scale, to solve problems in an analog fashion. That's all. Um, there's uh, things like this around, which in un somewhat unfortunately are probably technically correct, but they're very misleading. Uh, the, one of the, genera, gen, the person who probably is most responsible for the genesis of the field, David Deutsch, um, loves to talk about parallel universes and things like this. And of course, uh, it's a double-edged sword because when you're trying to build a real technology that acts in the real world, when you've got stuff like this floating around, 
it makes it uh, seem like you might be biting off more than you can chew. Uh, on the other hand, there are some very wonderful and remarkable things about quantum mechanics as applied to computation. So these are some pictures of the types of machines that we build. Most of what you're looking at here is part of the refrigeration system. These chips that we build have to be cooled to almost absolute zero. Uh, they're cooled to the lowest temperatures that you can achieve using a stock cooling system that you can buy off the shelf from a company. That's roughly um, 10 millikelvin, which is several hundred times colder than interstellar space. When these things are operating, they're potentially the coldest spots in the universe. If there aren't any other intelligent life forms that also build dilution refrigerators or something like them, they are. There's nothing in nature that's even close to this in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of coldness. The, uh, the chip itself is, sits in the middle of the, the, the bottom middle picture there. Uh, it sits in a custom-built motherboard connected to a wiring system that eliminates a lot of the noise that you get in conventional electronics and filters it down to um, the base temperature of the fridge where it does its thing. At a high level, this is what it looks like. I'm actually connected to one right now on my laptop. So if, if the technology works, I can actually show you solving some problems on an actual system. This laptop is now connected in the form of being a remote user. Uh, and we've got some nice, cool things I can show you uh, about this. But uh, the, the thing, again, that is kind of mind-blowing about this is that you think about the technology involved. So this wonderful piece of magic, this laptop, is connected via wireless, so we don't actually see it, somehow magically connected to some piece of technology, I don't even know where it is, that connects all, that can end, end up actuating a signal that sends currents down into millikelvin temperatures, solves things using quantum mechanics, spits the answers back, and I can see it on my screen. I mean, and if, if, you, if, you, if you're not like, if you're not at least amused, by how far technology has come over the last few years. I mean, I remember Pong, and I'm not that old, right? <laughs> okay, so what, what are the chips doing? Um, I'm only going to briefly dive into this to give you a high-level flavor of what the, these optimization tasks that I referred to in the compressive sensing intro are all about. But the idea is very simple. Um, much, much of AI, and in fact much of science, is based on using what are called graphical models to uh, encode and, and compute and understand. And all a graphical model is, is a set of nodes, here are these circles, connected by, or sometimes connected by, edges, which are the lines that connect them. So mathematicians call this thing a graph, or a network. So what uh, the optimization problem that these chips are designed to solve is, is given a graphical model that is a collection of these circles and edges connecting them, what I want to do is assign plus or minus one to each, et, each vertex, each circle. So I've, I've, I've showed you a potential solution here. And you can see that's because there are two possibilities for each guy. There's two to the number of however many there are possibilities. So here there's six vertices. So there's two to the six ways to color this thing. So if I'm going to assign a red or a blue to each circle, there's two to the six ways to do that. Now the underlying algebraic mathematics I'm showing up at the top. The S's are these plus minus one variables. So the S's have to be plus or minus one, and that's what you're looking for. That's the solution to the problem. The H's and the J's are real numbers that weight the relative preference for all of these things. So if, if you look at the J term, the J's are numbers that live on these edges. So for example, J12 lives here between S1 and S2. And that number sets the relative preference of these two guys. So if you look over here, you see that one of them is red and one of them is blue. So that may mean that that J has the sign that prefers those two guys to be opposite, so-called antiferromagnetic coupling. And also, the, the H's are biases on each of these nodes that cause them to want to be one or the other, biases them preferentially to be one or the other. And it turns out that the combination of these two terms creates a situation which, um, it, it, which allows you to embed extremely difficult problems. So finding the lowest energy configuration, the energy, the, the configuration of these guys that gives you the lowest possible E is what's known as an NP-hard optimization problem. Uh, so there's a lot of technical stuff that underlies what that means, 
but at a high level, it means in the worst case, it's very difficult and in fact scales exponentially with the size of the graph. So the amount of time you need to spend to get to that, to find the lowest uh, energy scales exponentially with the number of nodes in the worst case. So I'm going to give you a little bit more of a graphical way to think about this. Um, so imagine you, I were to label along the bottom here, these are minuses and pluses if you can't quite make them out. These are the two to the six possibilities for all of the ways I can label these nodes. And what I've shown here is the number you get when you plug these guys into that optimization function for a particular set of H's and J's. So I fixed the problem. Now I calculate what is the energy of each of the configurations. And this is a typical landscape that you see. Now what we're looking for are the ones that are lowest. So what this is done here is what's called enumeration. I've actually solved every single two to the six problem. I've plotted them. You can just look at it and say, hey, that one's the lowest and it's tied with that one. So those are the solutions I want. And in fact, the one I showed you, this one, is minus plus, minus, minus, plus, plus. It's the one that you want. And I showed you a different one here, which is a little higher in energy, which is a different configuration of these guys. And each of them has its own. Now the problem is, let's say I have a thousand variables instead of six. You can't enumerate two to the 1,000 variables because it's much, much greater than any number that exists in the universe physically. So you're stuck with only being able to see a part of this guy. So imagine you only had a window that you could look at here to here. How do you know which one is the lowest one? And it turns out with these so-called discrete optimization problems, uh, it's technically extremely difficult to find the lowest energy states. But those states are exactly the kinds of things that you need to do this compressive sensing reconstitution that I talked about, at least in some ways of doing it. So when I send you my vastly undersampled video stream, for you to reconstitute it, you have to spend computational effort. And sometimes you encounter problems like this. So what do you do? So what we're doing is building this special purpose hardware that in an analog way exploits quantum mechanics to try to solve these things better. It's a so-called quantum annealing algorithm. Uh, any of you that are interested in talking to me about how it works later, come talk to me. But at a top level, what we're going to try to do is, is take undersampled video and reconstitute it in hardware. Yeah? So what we did is we took a small video clip which is an academic data set, which is known as the Frey Faces data set. It's a, a series of about 2,000 images of a guy named Brendan Frey, uh, Frey, who's turning his head, sticking out his tongue, looking around, and so on. It's a data set that people use in order to test all sorts of vision uh, algorithms and, and learning algorithms. So we took that thing, which in its raw form is about 280 megabits. We undersampled it to 80 kilobits. And then we uh, reconstituted it using one of our chips. And so this is, uh, this is sort of what, what you see when you do it. Um, you see perfect reconstitution of the image from something that's quite undersampled. Uh, it works quite well. So I'm very happy about this. It's funny, like when you, when you actually build something that works and you still kind of don't understand really why it's working. I don't know if anybody's ever had this experience before. Usually when I build something and it works, I kind of, I can, I understand it perfectly well, but I'm still struggling with this a little bit. Okay, so that's, uh, that's it. Um, the key messages for this talk, something uh, maybe I didn't touch on enough, which is the reason why I think this belongs in this H, H plus uh, uh, environment, is com compression is somehow fundamentally linked to, to learning and understanding. When you can compress something, you can act on it much more efficiently with other algorithms that can sample from it and uh, extract meaning from it and, so and somehow um, uh, it, it makes it, it, it somehow targeted at the so-called curse of dimensionality that plagues a lot of AI, is that the objects that you're dealing with, like images, tend to have way more information than you can efficiently process using algorithms. So somehow you have to pull features out of that, so-called feature detection. And feature detection in learning is very strongly related to compression. So that's part of the reason why, uh, why I thought this was an, an, an apt topic for the, um, for the, for the talk. And also, of course, this other thing which is really cool is that these quantum processors are starting to do useful things in the world. And again, as I mentioned, I've got one hooked up here if anybody would like to see it. Thanks.